Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa, Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa, Namo Tassa, Bhagavato, Arahato, Sama, Sambuddhasa, Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So tonight we're going to examine what the Buddha found when he found 11 doors to Nibbana. I'm going to go and read this off the main screen. This is a reconstituted sutta. The name of the sutta is the man from Atta Kanagara, Atta Kanagara. And what, when I say it's reconstituted, it means that I'm using Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, but there are no more ditto marks in this sutta now. So what I sent you was basically a sutta where you don't need to worry about figuring out the ditto marks at all. So relax and listen to the sutta. You can take notes if you like and see if you can figure out what was going on with 10 doors to Nibbana. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the venerable Ananda was living at the Bello Vaga Maka near Vesali. Now on that occasion, the householder Dasama of Atakanagara had arrived at Pataliputta for some business or other. And then he went to a certain bhikkhu in Kukutis Park. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he asked him, where does the venerable Ananda live now, venerable sir? I wish to see the venerable Ananda. The Venerable Ananda is living in Belavagamaka near Vesali householder. When the householder, Dasama, had completed his business at Pataliputta, he went to the Venerable Ananda at Belavagamaka near Vesali. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he asked him, Venerable Ananda, has any one thing seen, been proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a bhikkhu abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated his undestroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Yes, how told her, one such thing has been proclaimed by the Blessed One. And what is that thing, Venerable Ananda? Here, householder, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is unaccompanied, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. He considers this and understands it thus. The first jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear 
spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain Nibbana without ever returning to the world. Now, what they're talking here about is basically first John is conditioned and volitionally produced. What we're going to see in this sutta is volitionally produced means I'm choosing to work in that direction. So I'm not trying to get this level. What's happening is I'm attempting to prepare myself so this level can occur, which is a bit different. I'm not trying to make it happen. Instead, I'm trying to prepare my conditions so that I can fall into that level. Remember the jhana picture I've given you before of the waterfalls and how each one of the levels, when we get in one, we wait until the conditions become right and it fills up in the second pool so that waterfall can start. And that's the second jhana. This is the same thing. We are conscious of the conditions and attempt to step away and allow the conditions to rise so we can fall into a level. When we go in these levels, we do realize that they are impermanent. So we are realizing a Nietzsche, that everything changes. So we don't ever try to hold on to any of the levels that we go through on the path because we know they were not there, they then arise, they are there, and they pass away. So there's no possibility of holding on to them because they are impermanent by the law of Anicca. Now it says in the middle of this paragraph, if he is steady in that understanding, then he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints because of the desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he will become one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes. Okay, the thing about this is you cannot desire the Dhamma too much. You may have heard a story once about, um, you know, you cannot want Nibbana if you want it you cannot have it. If you want the jhana, you cannot reach it. And so these things occur by us showing you how you can prepare yourself for the conditions so that these experiences can arise. But if you like the experience and you go back to sit and make it happen again, it, it won't happen. So it's tricky. And then with the destruction of the five lower fetters and your five lower fetters, are basically talking about um, the uh, first five, three fetters are with the sotapanna and the second two after that. So the, the fetters have to do with, um, first you have um, the understanding that this definitely is the practice and then uh, the teaching, and then you have the, um, the giving up of believing that any rites and rituals will help you to reach Nibbana. They don't help you, they calm you. And a lot of this has been misunderstood over time. Um, you'll find faith followers who will think that if they pray enough or they do the surface things enough that they would eventually get to Nibbana, but not in this lifetime, the Buddha is saying. So, and the third one is um, letting go of doubt, just letting go of any doubt in the practice. And um, I think I got all three. Did I get all three? I think I did, okay. And then the other two have to do with craving, um, with um, desire and aversion. You, you reduce that and then you gradually, as you keep practicing the steps of your six Rs, you will find out that you are purifying the mind each time you run the cycle. And that's when something, whenever something is pulling your attention away from what you're doing in life, or if you are sitting in meditation, it's pulling your attention away from the breath or away from the metta, either way. And what you do with that is 
as you feel the tension happen and that you're not with your object of meditation, then you gently let go of the attention and relax the head and smile and come back right away to into the uh, practice again. But you don't just throw something away and come right back and keep going because it won't work. Your attempt, your objective is to clear out any desire at all in your practice. So you keep letting go, relaxing, replacing with a smile as you come back to continue your observation. Now, this is one thing that was proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a, a bhikkhu or a student abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated, his dis, undestroyed taints come to be destroyed, and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Now, in this sutta, there are levels they're going through. Each one, as you accomplish that one, is attaining a security from bondage that he did not attain before, each one that you're passing through. But also the supreme highest one, security from bondage that he had not attained before, that one is the arahatship that he's looking for, that he's trying to reach, okay? It's his objective. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought or thinking and examining thought, a student enters and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with joy and happiness born of collectedness. He considers this and understands it thus. The second jhana is can conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is steady with that understanding, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the cessation, uh, the destruction of the taints because of a desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning to this world. So now we're looking at Anagami. We're looking at Anagami, he's not coming back, okay? And this too is one um, thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed. He attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. And that would be the Arahat, okay? Again, with the fading away as well of joy, a student enters upon and abides in the third jhana. The equanimity, the happiness, the mindfulness, and the unification of mind. He considers this and understands it thus. This third jhana is conditioned and it is volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning to, from this, that world. Once again, you're talking about Anagami level. And this too is one thing proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a um, a student abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. 
His unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed. He attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. And that being the arahatship. Again, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana and the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility. He considers this and understands it thus, the fourth jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced, but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent. It is subject to cessation. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world. So each time we're seeing this, this too is one thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed. He attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. And again, a monk abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued in loving kindness. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth directions, okay? So above, below, around, and everywhere should sound familiar to most of you. And two, always to himself, he abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will. He considers this and understands it thus, the deliverance of mind through the loving kindness is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. And if he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of the desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma then with the destruction of the five lower, lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. And this too is one thing that was proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees is fully accomplished and fully enlightened wherein a monk abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated and his undestroyed taints come to be destroyed. And he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. One of the things that happens when we're practicing, we've seen across the years, is a person can get caught in loving the Dhamma, in the way of loving the calm states or the internal joy that flows through the body, the ecstasy of these states. And we have to be very careful with that. We have to catch seeing the student doing this or make sure we pick up on it if we're guides because we need to pull them back because if they stay with that attitude, they cannot ever reach the goal they're trying to reach. Again, monk will abide pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, 
so above and below and around and everywhere, and to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without cruelty. He considers this and he understands it thus, the deliverance of mind through compassion is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. And if he is steady in that, in his mind, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of the desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. And this too is one thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Again, a monk abides pervading one quarter of the mind imbued with altruistic joy. And this is a joy where you're, you're very happy, but you're happy because the other person or someone else has accomplished something. It isn't on my accomplishment, it's on the other person's accomplishment. And it's very interesting to experience this altruism. Um, I like to call it an empathetic joy where you just get so happy that somebody has succeeded in something. Likewise, the second direction, likewise the third, likewise the fourth, and so above, below, around and everywhere, and to all as to himself. He abides pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with joy, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without discontent, he considers this and understands it thus. The deliverance of mind through joy is conditioned and volitionally produced, but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is steady in that, in his mind is clear, he attains the de destruction of the taints, but if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. This too is one thing that was proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened wherein if a bhikkhu, abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. His unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed. He attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. And again, a monk abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with equanimity. Likewise, the second likewise the third, likewise the fourth direction. So above, below, around and everywhere and all to all as to himself, he abides pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without cruelty. And he considers this and understands it thus, this deliverance of mind through equanimity is conditioned and volitionally produced without aversion. He considers this and understands it thus, 
This deliverance of mind through equanimity is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. And if he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and then attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world. This too was one thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a bhikkhu abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated his undestroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. And then again, with the complete surmounting of perception of forms, with the disappearance of perceptions of gross sensory impact. Now we get down to this level of reaching into the mental states with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, a bhikkhu enters in upon and he abides in the base of infinite space. He considers this and understands it thus, the attainment of the base of infinite space is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. So if he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints because of the desire for the Dhamma and the light in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one who is due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. And this too is one thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened. Wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated. His undestroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. So now they're basically talking about your practice in this sutta and how you are able to go through these different levels. This is a reflection in this sutta back to 111 in the conditions of the levels and reflecting it in an identical way. And this too is one thing proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees and is fully enlightened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind will come to be liberated. His taint, uh, undestroyed taints will come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security from bondage he had not attained before. What there's an echo in this sutta is that the stepping back away from what you want to have happen is what allows everything to happen in the practice. We get in the way if we get involved in attempting to manipulate things when we are doing the meditation. This has to do with the management of the hindrances also. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. A monk enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. He considers this and understands it thus. This attainment of the base of infinite consciousness is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if 
He does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma. Then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. And this too is one of the things proclaimed by the blessed one who knows and sees accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a monk abides diligent, ardent and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated, his undestroyed taints come to be destroyed and he attains the supreme security of bondage from bondage that he had not attained before. So he's getting level by level, level by level, making progress. Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a monk enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. And he considers this and understands it thus, this attainment of the base of nothingness is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced as impermanent subject to cessation. If he's steady in that, he attains the destruction of the taints. But if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, he becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning to this world. This too is one thing proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a bhikkhu abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind comes to be liberated, his undestroyed taints come to be destroyed, he attains the supreme security from bondage that he had not attained before. Now, when the Venerable Ananda had spoken, the householder Dasama of Atakanagara said to him, Venerable Ananda, just as if a man seeking one entrance to a hidden treasure came all at once upon 11 entrances to a hidden treasure. Ah, there's 11, I thought there were 10. <laughs> so too, while I was seeking one door to the deathless, I have come all at once to hear of 11 doors to the deathless. Just as if a man had a house with 11 doors and when the house caught on fire, he could flee to safety by any one of these 11 doors. So I can flee to safety by any one of these 11 doors to the deathless. Venerable sir, these sectarians will even seek a teacher's fee for their teachers. Why shouldn't I make an offering to the venerable Ananda? And then the householder Dasama of Atakantagara. He assembled the Asanga of Bhikkhus from Pataliputta in Vesali, and with his own hands he served and satisfied them with various kinds of good food, presented a pair of cloths for each bhikkhu, and presented a triple robe to the venerable Ananda. And he had a dwelling worth 500 built for the Venerable Ananda. So this adventure is showing you where all these doors are. And it's absolutely amazing that you can go into the first jhana and have the potential to go as far and have the experience of anagami or arahat. This is what's happening here. This is a potential that we hear about the 11 doors to the deathless via the first jhana, via the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, via loving kindness, via compassion, via the altruistic joy, via the equanimity. 
and via the space or consciousness or nothingness. In working with those objects, one person can go through. Early when I was practicing with Bhante, he would say to us, you know, a person who can sit even in one jhana can end up one time, can end up for a period of time in the pure abodes in another lifetime. And I was shocked about this, you know, always looking at the work we have to do on the path all the way through. But what this is about, a consistent training in meditation only? No, it's not. It is a training in meditation with a parallel training in understanding specifically for operational pur purposes in your meditation, the Dhamma that the Buddha was teaching at the same time. This is why we talk to you about the different parts of the tra training. We talk to you about how the teaching has to do with your training and your practice itself. So what you found in here, in this sutta, you found the Brahma Viharas being used. You found while you're dwelling in one of the realms, you found what was happening, um, what was happening uh, to, um, pull this apart, see who's here. Let's see, whoops, I can't, <laughs> here we go. I can't do it. Hmm. So we, we stop the share, let's stop there. There we go, hello. So now we find out we have 11 doors that we can play around with actually. But when we look at how we're practicing, I think the most interesting problem we run into is hindrances. And that's what holds us back is our desire to personally go after whatever we see as the objective. When we can reach the objective, if we step back and we let go, let go, let go, that's the most important part. There's this little voice inside us that says, you personally have to do this. And the Buddha is saying, no, actually you don't. I tell a story often of a man who went to the Buddha and said, my life is falling apart. Everything is on top of me. The weight of the whole world is just on top of me pressing down. I need to learn meditation. And he said, for what reason? And the man just smiled at him and said, I have to regain control of my life, control. The Buddha paused a moment and then he said to the man, I'll teach you meditation, but in order for you to progress in the meditation, you have to understand that you must let go of all control in order to see how things actually work. And by doing that, seeing the way that everything actually works, you will uncover the secret of escape or the antidote to the suffering. So by letting go, we begin to see by removing the personal perspective aspect of this and adopting an impersonal perspective. That's shifting from atta perspective into anatta perspective and approaching life that way, then everything gets easier, everything gets lighter. And we begin to see at any time, if we kept stepping away in the progress progression down the path, this is basically saying you could go through and experience Nibbana. So questions about this sutta, anybody, up to you. Do we have any questions, Dhamma Gavesi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, uh, uh, there are no questions uh, previously asked. Nobody sent me any questions. Uh, 
Uh, anybody who wants to ask questions, uh, they can ask now. So the objective of the sutta is to calm down your approach, tone it down, step away. When we have a student who is going into the deeper levels, when you're getting, you're practicing with, um, you are practicing with loving kindness and you're progressing into the Karuna, the Mudita and the Upeka. We're trying to get you to allow these levels to open up and develop. And if you keep letting go, understanding, why should I let go of a disturbance? Why can why should I, how do I let go of this disturbance? You leave it alone. You don't give it any attention. Your personal attention is the nutriment for the strength of the distraction. And if you let go of that, if you understand that, then you win, you win. It's like a military operation of wanting, um, of wanting uh, to, okay. It's like a military operation of wanting to defeat the enemy, but not have a, a major battle. And what the, in Sun Tzu, what they teach you in the art of war is find the supply line. If you honestly believe in your practice, any of you, that the distraction or disturbance, the distraction or the disturbance is an enemy, then find the supply line for the enemy, okay? And cut off the supply line, okay? And then that's it, They it just fades away and you can't have a battle anymore. Then sit back and see what happens as you go down the path. Okay, now the question was, what are the doors? The doors are basically in this sutta, the doors are the levels you pass through. This is what Ananda was explaining. And they on the path, if you want to, see what it was right whoops here Bhatti what was the number of the sutta it slips me now I can't find it. oh here we go no that's not it is it 60 60 what no Bhatti Namangavesi where are you? What What's the number of the suit? <laughs> 54, no? What is it? 64? There no, you go. Okay, 52, 52. Hmm. Atthaka Gara Sutta, that is uh, for 52. Thank you. I was in the 60s. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Um, okay. <laughs> what happened? Okay. If you want to see the 11 doors, we we'll put them, it's very simple. You count your suit, you count your, your levels. So you have first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. That's four doors. Then you have loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity. That gets you to eight doors, okay? Then you have infinite space, infinite consciousness, and nothingness. And that takes you to 11 doors. You'll notice that they didn't include, and he actually put a note in here about this. Um, you know, he did not include talking about neither perception or non-perception. I wonder if you can tell me why. Does anybody have want to take a shot at that? Why didn't he include that as a stepping stone? Is because you can't perceive it, neither perception or non-perception. You can't perceive it, so how can you count it as a step? which is noted in his, um, in his notes about that. This is pretty good notes in this one. It was kind of interesting. Um, the two terms, okay. The, The thing that we can't get overly attached to that keeps us away from simply going on the path 
is the serenity that sits in the jhanas and get addicted to it because the world is so much like this and then you're just in this wonderful place and then you want to be there so what we see happening with the deeper meditation forms that are one pointed very pointed there is actually a pressure happening on the brain to get to these levels that's happening and then when they get to them and it starts to open up it is so deep and so overwhelming there is no kind of awareness in it therefore you cannot um, you can get very addicted to this kind of feeling and but you this is what i mean if you try to learn these types of meditations without having another line of understanding the dhamma as you're learning to do the meditation you can end up with almost like being addicted to this and it's running your life and you go home and you walk in the house after work and you say okay everybody i want to just chill so the dog has to go out the kids need to go away um, turn off the TV. I don't want any noise. And they get addicted to silence. One pointedness, the one problem I have seen with my students, they have to realize that why am I complaining about the sound? I think Susan was here last time. I don't see her here right now from uh, Singapore, living in a place next to the ocean. And this is a very good example of this. She's living in an apartment by, or a house by the ocean, but she has not allowed the ocean to become her, to become part of her. And so she resents the sound of the ocean, which is considered white noise by a lot of people, okay? And if you don't understand how to become the waterfall or become the, the ocean, you're going to resent it and have this tension all the time. But if you relax and go through and let it flow through you until it becomes part of your balanced place, part of your living condition, then you discover I can live next to the ocean. You know, in India, I get used to the kids next door. <laughs> I mean, there's four or five of them. And the older brother is my favorite one because he's going to become an explosive expert for the military when he grows up. I'm sure of it because every morning, five firecrackers, by noontime, five more. And I think dad brings home another five to set off at night. It's a riot, you know, but now it's just there. It doesn't even, you don't even twitch, you know, because it's part of this environment. So you have all kinds of things like this that you experience in life. And if we resent them, we want them to stop. We know they're not going to stop, okay? They're part of the environment. So you can't defy your environment. You have to take it in. And some people aren't flexible at all. And others just, we have to adapt. <laughs> and monastics are funny because we adapt to anything. I have slept underneath an abbot's desk in Fort Myers, Florida. So he locked the door so I could stay in the building instead of sleeping in a truck because I was a woman, you know? I've slept in the basement of the temple up in Woodburn in Seattle because of the same thing. I couldn't be on the area in the floors upstairs. So I slept downstairs in the basement on the floor. And my daughter said to me, you know, you're 55. How can you be sleeping on the floor in the library? I said, Honey, they have really thick carpeting. And if I get bored, I can just get up and read a book. <laughs> and it was perfectly warm. It was the dead of winter in Seattle in December, but I was sleeping by the furnace. <laughs> so it's how is your perspective? Why would you resent this? Why would you demand something else. Why, why don't you? And then my favorite one of all time is being allowed to sleep in the basement of a six story building in New York City, which was the headquarters for the Burmese monks in America. And they were so sweet because when it was time for me to sleep, they took me down five flights of stairs into the basement to the army cot with a mattress on it with a lot of really nice warm uh, wonderful quilts over me and I was next to the furnace again this is a really good idea to sleep next to the furnace in December it was December again and there was this rat <laughs> and the rat was on a bookcase and he just sat there now the thing is 
I'm a forest person and I know about these animals. So I watched him to see if I should stay awake before I go to sleep or not. Is he gonna come and bite my nose or what? And basically all hamsters and gerbils and rats, you know, uh, if they're sitting there and they begin to do this, they go like this. They are just sitting there looking around and then they start to go like this and they're washing their face like this you know they're completely calm and they have accepted you. So you may as well say good night, have a good time on the bookcase, I'm on the bunk and we went to sleep, there's no problem. <laughs> but if I didn't know that, maybe I would have climbed up on the furnace and started screaming because there's a rat in the basement, but it's just, it's just the rat is a nosy, has a really good thing going in December in the basement by the furnace too. So look at it from that aspect, <laughs> why be upset? See, this is all, what am I doing here with this kind of thing? This is all perspective, perspective, you see? It's all making a decision. What is, what is really great about being here? What is my gratitude for being here in this position versus, oh my gosh, why am I in this position? Why is this happening to me? Why am I here and everybody else is sleeping on a bed somewhere? But why? You just have to accept what's happening. Having said that, I just bought a new bed. Okay. <laughs> But we had to do that because we because I have a back injury and I had to get a hard bed instead of a soft bed. So this is excusable. I remember that with the rat. <laughs> okay. Now somebody said you, you want to repeat. Is it what is it that you want to repeat the um, the uh, the doors? Is that what you want? The doors. I want to ask some questions. This is Kahema. Is it okay to ask questions? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, for the 11 doors, I just uh, understand that when we are able to reach to the Jana or uh, reach to the Brahma Vihara, it means that we can potentially reach the Nibbana. So, uh, and we learned that the Brahma Vihara, like a Metta, uh, karuna is equal to the fourth jhana and to the fifth jhana. So why Buddha using is in, in this sutta, Ananda said that uh, mentioned about jhana and Brahma Vihara differently. But in practice, we know that it's pretty equally to each other. For example, Metta equal to the fourth jhana and Karuna equal to the fifth jhana. So why in this okay, sutta? Let's, let's um, tune, tune what you're saying a little bit better because meta, the culmination point is the fourth jhana. I want you to just say it that way so some professor doesn't come down on you say, no, 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 that's not right. But the fourth jhana, the way we say it in the text, the, um, the, the loving kindness culminates. That means the end point of loving kindness is in the first, second, third, fourth jhana, that's the end. Culmination means the end, the culminating point, okay? And then karuna culminates in infinite space, okay? And then mudita culminates in infinite consciousness. And then the last part is that the, um, the um, equanimity culminates at the base of nothingness. So, so that's if you're working with the Brahma Viharas. What the interesting part about this is he's talking about 11 doors. When he's talking about 11 doors, he's basically saying if you're somebody who only is practicing, you can actually have to be, if you, if you understand the basics of the structure of the teaching, you can reach Nibbana through the first jhana or through the second, or through the third, it can happen. The thing to remember is this is telling you that it can happen at any time as you're going down the path. And it's very interesting because some people can come to a retreat and in just a couple of days, they're in the fourth jhana. And how does that happen? Because some other lifetime somewhere else they probably were sitting in meditation there. So the first, second, third just went like boop, 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 boop. 
And there in the fourth jhana, the second day of the retreat, M.A. did never do meditation before in this life. How does that happen? See? So that was one interesting part of it. If we go back and look to the stipulation of what you're talking about, each one, oh, I hate this way, but that's got the ditto marks, but each, each part, let me go into the share for just a minute, get back into the sutta for a second. Um, you'll notice that in each part, each section, it said this one part that if he is steady in that he attains, I meant, where is it? If he is steady, you see, but whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent subject to cessation. If the person is steady in that, it means steady in the understanding of that, can really totally internalize the anicca, dukkha, anatta. See, they can understand that the, um, the condition that has come up is always going to be impermanent. So they don't try to hang on to it. If they stay there long enough in that state, then all of a sudden they can clear out the taints and reach, uh, re attain, the final, attain Nibbana, experience Nibbana. But if they can't understand that because they are practicing with the knowledge and with the experience, then what happens is they will go into the pure abodes after this lifetime and they will be able to do final Nibbana from there. Get it? Get it? I got to come back to you. I can come back to you. Okay. You get it? I get it. Okay. And, and, and then the second question, I feel like when I read this sutta, it means uh, it's like a describing uh, anagami because study in in right. jhana right. like this, uh, first jhana or second jhana or third jhana is by choice only for right. anagami level. So I think this this sutta is talking about anagami. It's not about for the everyone. Am I right? No, it's got it's about both of them. I'll show you where it is in the sutta. Wait a minute. Bhante showed me when I was asking the same question. If we go back to um, number seven. Uh, I had it in seven. I was, it's really, they're all the same, but let's go back here. And it was saying basically uh, when it says, if he does not attain the destruction of the taints, then he's going to go to the pure abode and without ever returning to the world, he'll, he'll do his arahat ship there. But so you have the potential to go all the way through or to anagami. That's what the sutta is saying. If you're working clearly with the understanding of the practice and you're keeping the right effort cycle going, which is the purification and the retraining of the mind combined. See, one of the things that one of the things that has happened is that people think about. I think I've talked to you all before about how we have the breakdown in modern times of the life is one thing and your meditation is something you do at retreats. And when you work at retreats, when you leave, you leave the meditation at the retreat and come home and go back into the belly of the beast, as I call it. You go back, like I used to go to a retreat and then go back into Washington, D.C., which is the belly of the beast and get all this vibration and horrible stuff going on around on and everything all over again, okay? So you never make the progress. Bunty talks about uh, one person who came for 15 years to the retreats with Bunty, and I, I, I knew the person for many years. I watched this happen, where the person would go farther and farther along on the path, deeper and deeper and deeper in the retreat, then go home and just lose the, the attainment of the place they had gotten to. And the next year they came back, they had to start all over again. And this went on for 15 years until the person finally saw the pattern of what they were doing. And then they let go and they kept going, you see? And they put everything aside. We, we have so much information in the text about the statement of what we have to do 
in order to practice what the Buddha found and what he taught. And the best statement about it is that what he found, um, it can cause so much bewilderment in you, student, enough to cause you confusion. It, the teaching is very profound, hard to see and hard to understand. It is peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. That person thought they were smart enough, they could say, I've got that jhana and go home and just keep it in the pocket for a year and come back and say, now let me keep going. And then they found out they didn't have it anymore. You know, what I told someone one time was at a retreat or a talk I gave you, when you come to work with us, we are helping you to give birth to a baby. And they looked at me funny and I said, no kidding. We're giving, we're helping you to give birth to a baby. Now, if you go to the hospital and you help your wife have a baby, the hospital isn't responsible for that baby when you take it home. It's up to you what you do with that baby and what happens with it, isn't it? They're not gonna follow you home and take care of your uh, baby once it's born. And all I do as a guide, I'm like a midwife. Frankly, I'm like a midwife. And I am this guide who's trying to help you to give birth to a clear understanding of the teaching and in cooperation with the practice and, and weave together your understanding. And once I do that, I help you do that. I don't do it. Once I help you to get this this way, when you go home, it's up to you if you take your hands apart and put them in your pocket for a whole year and then come back and wonder why don't I have this anymore? You see, that's what's happening. And um, so when people say you can't make progress for 10 or 15 years, that's true. That's true. And I have a theory about it because so few people go beyond certain levels. I have a theory that if you are practicing something that is really tight like this, accidentally one day you slip and it opens up. That's where you get through if you get through. Accidentally one day you do relax and smile at yourself and then you go through or accidentally it happens. They can't explain anything else. Why, if, it, if, this is, if this, for instance, is, is the path that is correct, absolutely correct, and everybody wants to say, this is the way, and we've got to get there, and nobody's getting there in 150 years. Do you really want to drive that car because nobody has fixed it yet? <laughs> you know, that's kind of crazy. And, and you can take, you, you, you have to understand that you can take breathing meditation someone's been doing, and you can teach them to do the six R's with it. It'll be hard, but they can learn to do that. And if they do that and keep training on the Dhamma about how to let go of the disturbances, distractions, barriers, the blockages, the proper way, which is to just let go of them. Don't pay any attention to them. There's nothing in them. That's what's amazing to me. I thought I had to hold on to that. And Bonte would fight with me about it. You know, you have, no, I have to hold on to it in this. And we'd come back and say, but this came up again and it's still here. Why is it still there? It's there because I paid attention to it and I wanted to try to know how I could control it and make it go away. You see, that's, that's what we're looking at here. Yeah. So the secret of the hindrances is pretty simple. They eat personal attention. <laughs> that is their main course. They want to have it broiled or baked or grilled any way you want to give it to them. Personal attention. Yeah. There was another question. What did you get the other question on the board? Uh, Bhante Dhamma Gavesi? Was there another question? Hmm? Anybody else? Dr. Weera, hello. Yeah. Anybody else have a question on this one? Hmm? Oops, I can't, I can't hear. Doc, I can't hear. 
You turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Please explain the Chandaraga. Tell me what Chandaraga. Tell me what Chandaraga is, and I'll explain it to you. That's an American teacher speaking. <laughs> Tell me what the Chandaraga is, and I'll explain it to you. Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. I bet I can do that. Wait. I remember that word. Wait. Uh, here we go. Wait. 52. Got to go to the notes. Bhikkhu Bodhi did explain this. Chandaraga. I shouldn't speak so fast. I actually do know what that means. Um, but I had to go through here to find it. Five hundred and um, wait a second. No, it isn't what I thought. Oh, wait a minute. I saw it again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, in the notes, in the notes, uh, Sarma is the one that asked this. Is that right, Sarma? Damarajina. Dhamma yes. Okay. These two terms signify the attachment, the Chandaraga attachment with respect to serenity and insight. If one is able to discard all desire and attachment concerning serenity and insight, one becomes an Arahant. Very good. Okay. If one is able to uh, discard desire and attachment concerning serenity and insight, both of them, one becomes an arahat. If one cannot discard them, one becomes a non-returner and is born in the pure abodes. So that's what I'm saying. It's about arahatship and it's about anagami too, okay? the When they say, um, the part where it says discard all desire and attachment concerning serenity and insight, they're not talking about discarding your practice. They're talking about discarding your desire to hold on to the ideas, any ideas in Dhamma, any ideas at all. In order to reach the cessation, we have to let go, let go, let go, let go, let go, let go of everything, see? Does it make sense to you? Does that make sense to you, Sarma? Yes. Okay. So it's having to do with the um, the desire and attachment. Like I was talking about, it can be like a drug. Getting addicted to the uh, the deeper meditation is. You don't want to come to this for the escape from the world. It is an escape from the world. Sure it is. But you don't want that to be the reason why you're coming. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is they're having trouble with this. Some of the, um, you know, um, the um, psychotherapists are having trouble with this in the States because some people want to just leave everybody and go high. I once had a, a, a guy come to Dhamma uh, Sukha Meditation Center and basically say, I said, why do you want to be a monk? I would say, why do you want a meeting with Bhante to become a monk? And the answer was, I want to go up on the hillside and build a kuti and never come down. And of course, we wouldn't let him do it. He could do it somewhere else if he wanted to do it. But this is, a, this is the idea in the person's head. If I'm a monk and I have a kuti and I can go on the mountain and set it up and never face anybody again. I have a lot of questions before I let that person want to come into the family of monastics. And I'm supposed to be screening people who want to come in to go in monastics with Bhante. I have to figure out why are they coming in? If they are coming to escape, that's not the reason to be coming in, okay? And we, we listened to Ananda and Buddha's discussion 
uh, in the, um, no, what is it? It's uh, 48, um, um, gosh, where is that? In this one place they got to and they were gonna start a rains retreat and it's the Kasambian Sutta, I think is where it was. Yeah, okay. Um, and, um, and I think it's Ananda. He goes to the Buddha and he says, you know, we've got to leave. We can't stay here. We can't have the rains retreat here. Well, I mean, there were three or four villages prepared to give food and took in extra harvest to plan for them to come for this big rains retreat for three months. All these monks are there, but they're fighting each other in factions. They were not getting uh, along together like milk and water. <laughs> if you pour the milk in the water, you'll see what I mean. You get along just fine. Then you go take some oil out of the cabinet and pour that in another glass of water. And they were fighting with each other, just like oil and water instead of milk and water floating and working together. You see, they were no harmony. And so Ananda came and he said, I think we should leave. And what did the Buddha say to him? Basically, he, he gave him a little piece of instruction and said, if you leave here and we go over there, the same thing is going to happen where every place we go. <laughs> so why not figure out what to do about this so that people can get along? And they stayed, he, he wouldn't go, they had to do it. So it was about facing what it is that is happening as long as there is a way for it to work out, as long as there is. Stay there and try to work it out. If, if you can actually see a situation where if I don't go somewhere else, that might be the solution. You know, when you go somewhere else and it, you're not around the friction anymore, then your life's okay and the other people's lives are okay, then that might be the best thing to do. Yeah. So these lessons, we have to look at the way he was teaching about this. Anybody have any other questions? You always need to tell me if I go around a question because I'm getting older and sometimes this just kind of moves over there. And <laughs> so if I, I have miss a question. Yep. Okay, Susan. This is how Susan. Uh-huh. Hi. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. My question is um aragami. So there's six types of aragami. Would you please expound a bit on aragami? Um uh, there's six types oh. of aragami, huh? How come? I don't know. Aragami is something I just learned today from you. No, it's, right it's now. Not, no, it's not aragami. It's anagami. Anagami. Okay. What anagami? A N A G A M I. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh -huh. let's look on the screen here for a minute. Do you know the attainments at all? Do you know? Yeah, them? Just, yeah okay. understand about attainment. Yeah. Okay. So if Five we're looking, thousand. if we're looking at um. If we're looking at the attainments, there's uh -huh. only there's only one anagami and anagami with fruition. In the Buddhist camps, in the Buddhist teaching school, there are eight kinds of individuals. Boy, that's funny, isn't it? Okay. Eight kinds of individuals, okay? And this the kinds of individuals, they work like this. The first one you have is you have a sotapanna. Okay, uh -huh. sotapanna. So the first group, the first group, they're working toward the sotapanna. And this is the first attainment, okay? If you become sotapanna, you only will come back as a human being seven times. Uh -huh. And that's the maximum number that you would come back. And um, there's all kinds of, you, what you're attempting to do is get all the way to Arahat. Sotapanna, each one of the, the four attainments has a Sotapanna, and then you have a Sotapanna plus fruition. That's the second group. So once the people become Sotapanna, this is what the school, the meditation school looked like. You had these people here who were trying to become Sotapanna. Sotapannas were trying to become Sotapanna and fruition. So that's um, the second group, right? 
They're trying to mm. become so upon fruition. Once they become so upon in fruition, then they're the group that are working toward Saka Dagami. Okay. So the next one is Saka Dagami. Okay. And this one is, can come back one time more as come back one more time as a human being before they get to be an Arahat. Okay. Um, and then Saka Dagami has a, a Saka Dagami plus fruition. So there's a group that are going to try to be that one. And then I'm, I got to erase this other guy here a minute. Because I always run out of board when I do this. Sakadagami fruition. Then the Sakadagami and fruition group, they're going to attempt to, oops, attempt to erase the board. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're going to be, um, okay, they're going to be working towards becoming anagami. That's their next anagami. step, anagami. And anagami is a non-returner, okay? Oh. So the oh. anagami is not going to ever return again to be a human being. They will be in another realm, and in that realm, they will very like, they'll become arahat. They're not going to have another lifetime after the realm they go to. And the anagami has an anagami plus fruition, right? And then that, they're trying to get there. And so I guess you would say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, anagami mm -hmm. of fruition. And then the next group is going to be the ones that are trying to become arahat. Now, in one of the, uh, oops, arahat, arahat, and uh, the arahats are not finished. Some people think the arahats are finished, but the arahats have to also, um, they are the eighth group. They're trying to become an arahat plus fruition. So when we go hmm. to the Chabi Sadhana Sutta, I think it's Chabi Sadhana Sutta, I don't remember. I think maybe it's 112. Um, 112. If we look in there at 112, yeah, Chubby Sadhana, we're going to find out that sometimes Arahats are walking around thinking they're finished, but they're not finished. Now, this is one of the things you've heard me talk about slippage, okay? Slippage is when um, you have something, you have a fact in the beginning. And then you go down the timeline and somewhere in here, the fact, it changes. It, it less like a fact plus one, <laughs> or it becomes changes more to fact plus two. And one of the things that's changed is the idea that if you're an Arahat, you're done, but you're not done. You have to be an Arahat in fruition, just like, and what is the fruition part? The fruition part is the glue. Okay, you can become a sotapanna in a retreat, but if you don't reach sotapanna and fruition, then you can lose uh, the you can lose the sotapanna accomplishment and have to do it again. That can happen. You can if you fall back on your precepts and you fall back on how you're living and that sort of thing, then you can lose sotapanna. So you have to do it again. And then you would come up and do so to ponder fruition. If you have fruition, okay, you're in good shape. If you have fruition, you're locked in. And just in each one of these, the fruition is like glue. You cannot mm. lose it in this lifetime. That's how the system was set up. Okay. Okay. Then now mm. the non, there's two types of non-returners, right? The ones who are the anagami. They're yeah. non-returner and the arahats, they are non-return. They're not going to return. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So, so may I so, share? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, uh, will you finish or when? No, go ahead. You can ask again. Uh, so Buddhism is new for me. I'm 60 uh -huh. years old. I'm 60 okay. and I, and Buddhism resurfaced. I, when I was a teenager, I was a, studying Buddhist, Buddhism. Anyway, my point is, uh -huh. I always thought for all my 60 years of life, I always thought when I die, I don't want to come back as a human. Who, who, why should I come back as a human? Why should I come back to earth? There is so many more 
uh, life form out there, so much more dimension. When people say, I'll come back as so and so, I would like, why come back to earth? So narrow minded, be, be, be something else. So am I wrong? How, how could my belief the now problem, shed? Okay, the, the thing is in Buddhism, I'm not here, okay? It's like this, this body is basically mm. a shell. It is a case. And mm. while I, in this lifetime, have activated this body, I'm performing what's called karma. And we, we are going to talk about karma next week. Um, I, we didn't do it this week. I have to straighten out some things with the installments. And I also had this question come up and was driven to teach you this one tonight. But, but um, you know, um, we don't have re reincarnation. What you just described to me is reincarnation. In Buddhism, mm. actually, Buddhism has rebirth. So what is the difference? Well, the Buddha taught the middle way. And instead of saying that you have a soul inside you and that you are a you, a per an individual person that's going to go through time like this, that's not what happens. What happens is when you do actions in the world during your lifetime, good actions or bad actions, comma means action, okay? And when you do those actions, whatever they are, good or bad, you have intention before you do them, that's the chetana, and then you do the action, that's the comma. The comma produces an energy action whenever you have something moving it produces action and we look at this and we say the brain has all this energy and electricity and when it does something moves forward it produces a kind of energy inside of us so when we die what happens to the body is like a wet log sitting on the side of the road and we can't use it anymore can't use it for a fire it isn't good for anything so people cremate their bodies there's no reason to put them in a trunk and take up space in a coffin but if a person wants to that's fine but it's just you don't need to do that if when people do cremation then they look at the end of the shell is just like it, especially in Asia, if a person dies and laying on the side of the road, they're going to mummify pretty quick. All of the water comes out of them and there's just a skin and hanging over organs inside and bones. And that's something we study also to understand what's happening, what we really are. Okay. But the energy inside of you, when your person dies within the first you know, I was reading about this medically and I've done it a few times with people who have died. If you put your hand up on top over their head like this, they're lying there and you put your hand up over their head. When they die for the about 30 minutes or so, within 30 minutes, all the heat in the body has all come together, will come out and heat is energy flows out. Where? Flows out into a universal consciousness. It's like the conscious, it flows into like a uni universe of free floating consciousness. Huh. So what you do in your life produces a wholesome energy and or an unwholesome energy that flows out into the universe. And then in another birth, you may be born a man. You can't control it. <laughs> I mean, when I did some past life work to figure out why I had a phobia once, I found out I had been a man a number of times and a woman a number of times. And I said, what's going on? When I came out, I thought it was going to be woman, 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 Queen of Sheba back there somewhere. <laughs> and here it was like, um, you know, warrior, farmer, worker, um, you know, soldier, this sort of thing happening. And then these other women weavers and um uh, weavers and soothsayers and uh, teachers and different things coming up as a woman. This was very interesting to me. And there's a story about uh, what happened when I, with the phobia, because I became at 52 years old. I started studying when I was 50. At 52 years old, very suddenly, I could not climb a ladder. This didn't make any sense for me. I had been a tomboy climbing trees, 50, 40, 50 feet in the air, never had any fear. A couple of years before going with Bonte, I was flying experimental planes 
over the ocean, small, tiny little planes over the ocean, no fear at all. <laughs> thousand feet, 3000 feet in the air, hang gliding, surfing with kites. I was doing all that stuff. All of a sudden, I can't climb a ladder. My whole body freezes up. I get gray in the face, soaking wet and have to come down the ladder while somebody holds the ladder. This was ridiculous. Monty mm -hmm. says, you know, I think we can fix that. I said, how? You have to find out why it happened. Because for 50 years, this person is not afraid of heights in any way. And now all of a sudden they're afraid. There are books about this now. There are some uh, psychiatrists who are writing books about this now. You can look them up on the internet. Um, the removal of phobia by going through past lives or recalling past lives or something, past life regression and phobias, you know. But this was real, okay? So we went up to the fire tower and I couldn't climb to the top. And that was ridiculous. I could the year before, but I couldn't go up any more than one level of stairs on this, you know, just metal thing that has a ladder going to the top. And I started crying and I came down and he said, well, let's go to work. And you have to get into the fourth jhana very, very securely into the fourth jhana in equanimity. And I did. I worked on that for a while. We went to Florida. And while we were in Florida, I got into very deeply at that time was when I did this. Um, and what happened was we did, he said, just, I'm going to show you how to roll time backwards. I said, what? <laughs> he said, no, you can roll time backwards. I said, whoever heard of such a thing? So he tried to show me how to do it. It's not difficult to teach someone, but you have to have this equanimity at your beck and call. You have to be able to have it so that you're absolutely positively don't believe what you see or taste or smell when this happens. Because you can be standing in front of somebody all of a sudden while you're, you're meditating, all of a sudden somebody's in front of you and you can come out and the person's right there in front of you and there's a scene and that you can smell them, you can prep. I didn't touch anyone. I was afraid to touch anyone, but the person's right there. You can talk to them. You can ask them questions. And I already figured I wasn't really interested in being a wonderful, marvelous person who can do past life stuff. I was just doing this to get rid of being afraid of heights. That was my only reason for doing it. So when I met these women who turned out to be 50, how old are you? I'm 52. 60. Cool. Yeah, I know, but I mean, I when I met someone in the meditation, I would say, how old are you? I didn't care about their name. I didn't care about the town. I didn't care what that town was or what that ship was or what the port was or anything. I just wanted to know what are, who are you? <laughs> what What's happening? Well, I have, I'm working on the wall today. Why are you working on the wall? I'm that's, I have to work on fixing the wall with these other women. And the woman's 52. And then she went up on the wall and she fell off and killed herself. Oh. And then I went and did another. I was really upset the first time. And I came out afterwards. I said, I don't know. He said, just do it again. Then we went through a woman who fell off a wall, one who fell off a roof, one who fell off the mast of a ship, one who fell off a cliff, and one who fell into a ravine in a pasture, a big hole in a pasture. All of them were 52, 51 years old. What's going on? I don't know. I don't know. But you know what happened here in my brain was huh. this phobia obviously has nothing to do with this lifetime. And what happened to them was there somewhere else. Didn't matter where it was. And something clicked. And then I said, I don't think I'm afraid of the ladder anymore. And we went out and I could go up the ladder. And he said, well, let's see if you're really fixed. We went up to the fire tower and I went up all five flights of stairs and just went, I'm at the top <laughs> and laughed and came down. And I said, that is the darndest thing I've ever experienced in my whole life. Absolutely the craziest thing. And it was a disconnect somehow inside left over from somebody else's actions was this unbelievable fear all of a sudden, but only when I got to 52 years old. You mm. explain it to me. I can't explain it to you. Now, what I did do with another woman about a year later was I helped her to 
be able to sit in the river. This is funny. In, to me, it was funny. It wasn't funny to her at all. The water is this deep where she wanted to put a chair to sit in the chair while her children played in front of her in the water in the river and she could not do it. And when I saw what was going on, I offered to teach her and taught her to do enough meditation that she could do basically the same thing I did. And it went on for about three, four months. And then she did it. She overcame the fear of the water. What did she find? These other women drowned. And water, the sound of it, the feel of it, anything on your body. She could take a shower, but suddenly she couldn't go near this river at all. And then she just ended up, she was fine. So whatever these people are writing in these books, I haven't had time to read one, but I wish somebody would read one of them. Uh, they say they're very good and it has to do with phobias and it has to do with past life regression. I did this through meditation because that's what I do. Other people do this by sitting down under hypnosis and going back, okay, that way. So both of these are effective methods. Will I teach you to do this? No. <laughs> the reason is if I had a place that was a, really a place where you could come and stay and you were around me, I would consider it. But seeing what I went through with this, as a teacher now, I would not do it unless the person was around me. And that's where we make the mistake this year when somebody thinks they're really smart and they can teach somebody to do stuff like that without the teacher around. Because some of the stuff I saw was really scary. You know, really scary. The women were one thing. I found some of the men and it was terrible. And it was very, very scary. But he was there and I could break the sitting, go outside, say what I saw and have him ask me this famous question. And is it real? <laughs> no, it's not real, but I could palpate it and smell it, feel the oil like on your face. Everything in the environment was there. And another student was on the deck of a ship and turned to the right side and saw an identical twin who was the captain of the ship when he was doing this with Bonte one time. And um, I think more or less, he was really not doing it for that kind of reason. He just wanted to know if rebirth had any relationship to past relatives. And he actually felt like he found one of his relatives from way, way back and they were on a ship. So I don't know, That's, these are things we can explain. I'm not going to apologize for bringing it up, but I think people need to keep an open mind because there's an awful lot on the face of this earth right now. We don't know about human beings and we <laughs> thought we did, but who knows? Thank so you we for, know. and thank what you our for the are. explanations. Thank you for the, the explanation about rebirth and reincarnation, although I must apologize, I wasn't very clear of what my question were. My question was that if I were to die, I always believe I won't come back as a human, nothing to do with human, nothing to do with earth, rebirth into something else. So you don't learning... know that one of the things, if we had a chance to really do a class on it, Susan, there's about 32 realms and there are different things. And the thing you can come, you can, end up coming back in an, an animal birth or in a, as a bird or an animal or a fish or almost anything. One woman actually went back and she claims that she recalled being one of the jellyfish. A That's jellyfish. still on earth. Yeah. That's all on earth, right? Yeah, but she, that was not necessarily on earth. She doesn't know where she was. And that's it. You know, when you do, you have these types of recalling and going back to figure, to do that sort of thing. It's very hard to be there and be calm enough, long enough <laughs> to see this in front of you or what's going on around you, but also figure out what color trees are and where you are or anything like that. So it's um, situations of reincarnation have happened, but the Buddha was expressing the general thing that happens to everyone. It has to do more with rebirth. And it's the energy that we produce from the actions we take in life is how it works. And you don't necessarily, when I say to you that the 
Sotapanna, this is one of the questions we used to ask. Does the Sotapanna come back to earth seven times? Not necessarily. Not necessarily at all. It's seven more lifetimes before becoming, uh, uh, you know, being able to become an Arahat, you see? And same thing with the Sotapanna comes back one more time. Back one more time where, why, as what? As a human being again, we can buy that part, but where or as an intelligent life form that can continue to reason out what you learned in this lifetime. Yeah, you can buy that pretty easily. But on this Sorry. planet, or are you going to show up on a planet where the, the dirt is orange and the trees are purple and the, definitely the leaves are all red and turn green in the fall instead? <laughs> I remember my son got in a lot of trouble in, in kindergarten because he drew the trees the wrong color. And I looked, I didn't have much to say to the teacher at that time because I thought, you know, in his mind, maybe his trees were that color. What's wrong with that? And she said, no, there must be something definitively, psychologically, that we need to look at in this child because it wasn't a brown tree with green leaves. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, but I think I started laughing and said, look, I'll talk to you next week. And I took Eli and I went home because <laughs> I, I never could get upset about that. I, I have too much fun with art when I was growing up. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Anybody sadu, else? Sadu, sadu. Anybody else have a question we can go off on <laughs> a little bit? Okay. How are we doing? Okay. So it's 18. So it's 820. Do we want to stop? Are we all in agreement? Hmm? We okay? Anybody else have one more question? <laughs> Is there one more? Nifty's is quiet today. <laughs> okay. I'll explain later. It's been a day. <laughs> okay. Yeah, those days happen. I know they do. Okay. So we will do our closing. It was fun tonight. I'm sorry. It maybe went a little bit longer. Um, I just wish I had somebody who was working with us um, with computers that knew how to um, cut. <laughs> some of the things off with, because what we ended up doing with Bhakti's talks a long time ago, I think it, we still do it, I'm not sure, but we didn't have two microphones ever. And so when we had a long talk from him answering questions, we would just cut the questions, turn it off at the end of the Dhamma talk and then not have the question, but it's fun to have the questions out for everybody to um, think about, okay? Uh, one more. Announcement we have to make. Uh, uh, Bante uh, is uh, gone for a treatment. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. This Saturday, um, yesterday, um, they were in Houston. Uh, David and Bante were in Houston, Texas, you know, and um, he's going to a um, healer in Texas. They were doing 28 tests on his legs. So we thought this Saturday, Dama Gavesi and I were thinking, uh, that this would be a good idea for everybody to be sending a lot of meta and a lot of karuna to, to Bunty, uh, whether they're in Texas uh, or whether they're in Missouri, doesn't matter. Just be sending it to Bunty Vimula Ramsey and help him as much as possible with uh, finding a solution for his legs. Okay, that's real important to him. So we'd all like to do that for the sitting on Saturday when we have it. Okay, great. Okay, we'll say our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit of ours. Right. May, <laughs> for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.